community. As the city of Elgin begins to grow at a faster rate and the problems become more complex and the issues facing the city and the council as we enter the next decade could rival any storyline on network television. You might want to put down your TV remote and for 24 Wednesdays a year come to 150 Dexter Court and see the high drama unfold. Last Wednesday night's drama could challenge the storyline of NYPD Blue. Chief Charles Gruber getting a vote of confidence, sort of, from the council. Still to be worked out, a complicated land deal between the city, ECC, and the neighborhood, with emotions involved that rivaled J.R. Ewing in his old Dallas days. A good note to open the 8 o'clock meeting, the clergyman who helped quiet the city after a recent shooting death of an Elgin teen spoke to the council. You really want to say that it was a community effort. It was a co co uh, corroboration with both the police department, people in the community, uh, and citizens like Mr. Wilbur Daniels, uh, ministers like uh, Pastor Tate and Pastor Marks, Pastor Gazette, uh, Pastor Stewart, and uh, surely we can't say enough about uh, people like uh, uh, Sergeant Smith and, uh, and also our chief, who uh, at that particular time, uh, last Monday, was really count, kind of violator in the sense of some of the things that was happening uh, and some of the anger, angry that was coming out of those young men. But uh, level head prevailed, and uh, we averted maybe that something that could have been a tragic situation. So we want to thank you all for inviting us here for the invocation and to give these words, and hopefully in the real, real near future that we can have some serious dialogue, some things that we can do to possibly uh, uh, avert and prevent uh, other people from getting into gangs. Chief Charles Gruber's name surfaced later on Wednesday evening amid rumors that some council members and police sergeant James Kelly are in favor of firing the police chief. A unique resolution was presented by Councilman Robert Gilliam, reminding everyone that Chief Charles Gruber's job fate technically belongs to Rick Helwig. I think we need to make a stand and to do two things. One, indicate that we support the council manager form of government. And the council manager's form of government, which the electorate said they wanted to keep, that's the city manager's responsibility <coughs> to decide under him whether the chief will work here or not work here, and other employees except for the city clerk, that it's his decision to do that. That's the way the council manager form of government works. It's not our, it's not our decision to try and terminate or fire the, the police chief. We shouldn't be involved in, in the in the day to day decisions that go on. That's up to the, the chief and the city manager. We need to send a message to, to Sergeant Kelly and those folks that like like him that they're not gonna run the police department, they're not gonna change the police department, they're not gonna determine who's, who's the chief of the police department. That is determined by the city manager. I just don't know why we had to be educated to this fact. Uh, I'm I'm certainly well aware of what the city manager form of government stands for. I've worked under it for 18 years. So there's no question in my mind. Uh, there, along with this responsibility of hiring and firing, the city manager must also be responsible for the actions of any employee <coughs> under his command. And I don't see that mentioned here, so I'd like to mention it. The vote on the resolution was five yes from yes. Council Members Gilliam, McKevitt, Schock, yes. Walters, and Mayor yes. Kevin Kelly. Yes. Marie Yearman and Terry right. Gavin voted present. Council gave preliminary approval to a rebate of back property taxes of over $58,000 on the Elgin Inn property on Route 31 if Judson College can finalize a deal to purchase the building. The Judson College president gave some preliminary ideas to the council on how the building would be used. In the pavilion area, we would convert that mostly to classrooms. We are in desperate need of classrooms. On the second and third floors, we would uh, install uh, our business uh, department, our education department, uh, as well as the very fast-growing uh, adult education program or continuing ed school. 
Most in attendance were there for another college-related issue as council decided to discuss the proposed land swap between ECC and the city in open session at the next city council meeting on September 27th. The issues are complex, and Mayor Kelly had several thoughts to express to the council and the audience. How could the city of Belgium be expected to make a major strategic and financial decision such as this land swap proposal without receiving any sophisticated analysis whatsoever that comes even close to justifying the multi-million dollar expenditures that they're talking about? resources on multi-million dollar projects without solid justification. To date, none has been provided. Now, I've got three more pages of why I think this report falls far short. Uh, they have to do with 25 acre densities on that high density property and all of the uh, complexities that go with that, several of which I asked for information for in executive session and didn't get it. How many people up here at the dais can tell me what tax programs would provide the financing to get this high density in there? Because it's certainly not in the report. I don't know what these subsidy programs are called. I want to know the complexities of these programs and how they work. What about the golf course? What about the golfers? What do they think? We've got a long way to go. What about trading some density on the 25 acres for the 51 acres of commercial property zoned by the zone at the same time and owned by the same uh, property owner. What happened to that discussion? It certainly wasn't in the report. So I want to see a lot more information before I'm ready to do anything. And I think that the staff at both institutions has a heck of a long way to go and a lot of analysis to do to get the information we need to make this long-term decision. As you can see from the statements of Mayor Kevin Kelly, very emotional at times, so we'll continue with the ECC land swap and the neighborhood uh, gathering. And we have from Woodbridge uh, Townhouse, uh, you are a proud owner right there, we have Richard Swikart with us. R Richard, how are you, sir? Fine. You, of course, uh, you along with the uh, Save Our Neighborhood or our, the See Our Neighborhood group, mm -hmm. uh, the College Green folks have certainly been making themselves known, and viable, and, and their dislike of the what was the original concept of the land swap. Why don't you tell me how the group feels after Wednesday's council meeting? Well, I think as a whole, the group is, is very comfortable with the openness now that the council is taking with this and with the uh, active participation now that's been offered also by the uh, city manager and his chief planner. Uh, when the meeting started out, we of course had a little bit of concern about uh, the fact that here was a second time that it looked like we were having a closed session meeting and that we weren't being involved in the process as we had originally requested and put in with our petitions. But then we heard the uh, a president of Judson College put his presentation forward. And what we saw was a presentation where the homework had been done well, where the solutions presented were good for the community, good for the college, good for the city, and was very positive all the way around. And what we're looking for is a solution with this ECC land swap that meets these same types of criteria. So we're very thankful to the mayor for stopping the process as it is now because quite honestly the homework hasn't been done. He brought that out very clearly. There is much more research that needs to be done in order to make a good sound decision that's good for now and good five to 10 years, 20 years from now. Now let's talk about the aspect on September 27th at the next council meeting, the early meeting at mm -hmm. 6.30. Now discussion of the land swap will come up. What do you envision will happen there, or are you going to present more information uh, to the council before then? What is your group's? What well, are they do? We, we met last night, and uh, we've drawn up some preliminary plans to uh, meet with Mr. Dahlstrom so that uh, uh, we can obtain some of the information that is going to be uh, used by the city and also that has been used by the city to look at various alternatives. Uh, I don't see how, though, in two weeks, the city staff can put together the entire package that the mayor has asked for. That looks like a lot of detailed planning. And we can't do that because we don't have the legal right or the resources to do this type of research. So we are dependent upon the city staff and the ECC staff to provide the data that's necessary for all of us to sit down and make a good uh, you know, decision for the community as a whole.
Some members of the uh, CR neighborhood group, Tom Monahan, to name one, was a little disappointed that it, there was talk it might become a public meeting, say, in, in a week up the road, a Wednesday up the road. That didn't happen, and, and he was a little concerned that maybe once it gets into the, the council at any time, uh, it, it's out of their hands a little bit. Do you fear that? Well, I, I think his concerns are... Uh, uh, are founded on past actions. Uh, I, I, I'm very hopeful uh, that the action shown by the city council, Councilman Yearman, Gavin, uh, Wednesday night are going to be the step that we're going in the present uh, uh, and the, the way we're going to proceed in the future. And that is with open meetings, with full disclosure, with good research so that we can sit down as a community again to make the right decision. And again as Elgin changes so much stories like this are amazing when they unfold so we invite everybody to come on out on September 27th oh, and they're, they're going to see some interesting things I think. Yes, yes I think so. It's uh, it's one of the one of the nice things about this I mean out of everything comes good things I think at least somewhat is that we're developing quite a sense of community within the, the approximately 1,500 uh, homeowners there. And uh, I think a civic pride that's not going to stop when this particular issue is over, but that we're going to be there in the future to to respond to uh, requirements. And that's good. And Richard, a lot of those uh, neighborhood folks there were new to the city, so it does develop into future goodness as well. Yes. Richard, we're out of time. We appreciate the okay. information. Good luck to you. We'll see you on September 27th. All right, thank you. Richard Swikert from the Woodbridge Townhomes. We're going to take a quick time out. We'll continue with more of the Elgin Week in Review after these. Here we go. Yeah. Dress for success. All right. Dress true. Look good. Like a true American. The Army National Guard. Americans at their best. As you get older, the things you have dreamed of all your life are beginning to pay off. But if you're over 60, or black and over 40, something can sneak up on you gradually. Look, it's called glaucoma. And if you don't get your eyes examined, it can lead to blindness. You got your hair cut. Yeah. Oh, you big girl, I'm so proud of you. Don't lose sight of glaucoma. On, get the facts. Wednesday nights, an hour of ideas whose time had come and ones that will shape our future. I know you're gonna do this. Discover the gimmicks, gadgets, and gizmos of yesterday, and marvel at the ultra-sophisticated, high-tech tools of tomorrow. It's alive! Don't miss Invention and Next Step. Wednesdays, beginning at 8 Central on the Discovery Channel. There are lots of different names for noses. Um, snout, schnoz, um, ski slope, booger factory. But no matter what kind you have, or what you call it, if you use your nose to sniff household stuff to get high, you could get brain damage. Or die. And that's called just plain stupid. Last Sunday, the Gifford Park Association presented the 14th Annual Historic House Tour. This year, the homes were all located in the Northeast neighborhood, which is Elgin's next to be slated to be a historic district. In our generation, it seems, homes come and go or change drastically with each owner. The homes are nature, are structures that have withstood the test of time. Over 400 people helped to put this tour on, and about 1,200 tickets were sold. Our Channel 4 cameras made the walk, and we got a chance to see some of the 10 homes on the tour. Sue Robinson files this report. The oldest house on the walk is here, the Kern House at 827 Prospect, built in 1882. The property had dubious beginnings when Charles Kern purchased Lot 19, but accidentally built his home on Lot 20. After two years of legal wranglings with the owner of Lot 20, a man notorious for not living up to his agreements, Charles Kern was finally able to buy the lot that his house stands on today. Incredibly, as we look at this historical paperwork from the Elgin Lumber Company, it shows this property cost only $750 to build 113 years ago. This Queen Anne house on the tour is certainly an eye-catcher. 
Thankfully, despite the cost, someone is going to great lengths to save this stylish structure. This is the restoration in progress house. As you will see when you walk through the house, much of the work is still in the process of being carried out by the current owners. This house was built in 1887 for its original owners, Elizabeth and Philip Freiler, at a cost of approximately $12,000, which was quite substantial at that time. This huge line of folks were fascinated with the Freiler family history. Patriarch Philip was a prominent liquor distributor in Elgin in the late 1800s. His brand was Father Time Rye Whiskey, sold under the slogan, Drink Father Time Rye Whiskey, Sure Cure for Coughs and Colds. When Elgin voted to go dry in 1914, Freiler moved his successful business to Chicago, but remained very active in Elgin. And look at this beautiful sun, which seemed to be nature's way of guiding us to our next stop on the house tour, which was 619 Center. This American Foursquare, with colonial revival influence, has a shingled second story which flares outward. With so many houses to see, it was difficult to say goodbye to any of them. For those on the tour, not only did we learn the history of the homes, but we had Elgin's walking encyclopedia, Mike Alft, telling historical Elgin stories as only he can. We leaned in as Mike told the crowd how Elgin's railroad industry helped lead to its most important manufacturer. The director of the railroad came to Elgin, the Glen and Chicago Union, also owned land in Elgin. And in 1864, he was approached by a group of investors who asked if he was interested in sponsoring a watch factory. And he, because he had investments in Elgin, he asked the people here if they would like a watch factory. All they had to do was furnish him 35 acres of land and $25,000 in stock. And that's the beginning of the watch factory. The first Elgin watch began ticking in 1867. Its serial number is 101, and it's on display at the Hemmons Building in the Civic Center. Watch number 102 is on display at the Time Museum. Students of the U46 School District have been back in session for about three weeks now, and last week one of the most ambitious projects began for the new school year. The Building Trades Program, which started for a fourth school year. We saw the great historic homes on the walking tour. Now, with the help of this program and the skill of the teachers and students involved, future historic homes are being built in the name of education. Why don't you grab your hammer and hard hat and let's take in this year's first day of learning and building. These U46 students will be busy this school year, as by next spring on this side at 1230 Hackberry, not far from Elgin High School, they will build a brand new two-story single-family home as part of the U46 Building Trades Program. This will be the fourth house that the Building Trades students have constructed since 1992. District U46 recovers all construction costs related to the building of the house when the house is sold. Any profits are reinvested in the program to offset other costs such as site acquisition. The chairperson of the Building Trades Council tells us why this program is so important. The reason this is important is when I looked at the program back in the early 90s, it was uh, pretty much a production woodworking class. And if you look in the area, there are very few and fewer every, every year um, of woodworking type shops that are building production type cabinetry bookshelves. Yet uh, in the immediate Elgin area, when you take in Lake in the Hills, Algonquin, it's the number two housing market in Chicago. And I had a sense that uh, the district, U46, was not preparing our students adequately for a career in, in building trades. And so I put together an advisory council and with their support and the support of the board and the staff, we were able to redirect the efforts of, the, of this Votech program and take it away from production woodworking and, and go into the construction trades and started building homes because there's nothing better than first-hand experience at uh, giving students the skill sets they need for a career in building trades. There are similar programs in the St. Charles and Palatine school districts. Of course, it's a win-win situation for everybody. Our city gets good quality housing and the students get a more balanced education and real life work experience. A number of them have graduated uh, and taken that degree to, um, in, into the trades and uh, have taken jobs uh, with various builders in the area, some commercial, some residential. Others have gone on to two-year and four-year colleges but feel that the, the skill sets they received and participating in this program will serve them well in any career. I know in my day I had trouble passing industrial drawings, so these kids have great talent. That home should be done in springtime. 1996. Tell you what, we're going to take a quick time out. We'll continue with more of the Elgin Week in Review right after this.
The Elgin Corps of the Salvation Army have been helping people in our community with human needs since 1885. The social service programs of the Salvation Army in Elgin provides food from our food pantry for the hungry, clothing for those who need it out of our as-is store. We provide prescriptions for the sick and also provide rent and utility help for those who need it. The Salvation Army Through the Pads program provides a warm, safe place for homeless people to stay. They also receive a warm meal in the evening and breakfast in the morning before they go their appointed ways. But we need your help in order for this program to be a success. You may do so by mailing your check to the Salvation Army, Post Office Box 96, or by stopping by the building at 316 Douglas and leaving off your donation. Lend your support to the Elgin Chapter of the Salvation Army, serving our community since 1885. I gotta go, Henry. Wait, you've been drinking too much. Let's just take a taxi. You kidding me? Give me that. Yeah, you're right. Let's take a taxi. Driving intoxicated puts you and everyone else at risk. Drive smart, drive sober. Image is just about everything someone once said, and maybe you or someone you know or some group you're involved with helped out the image of Elgin this past year. Nominations for one of the 10 Elgin Image Awards are due by next Thursday, September 21st. Elgin is a diverse community with diverse population and problems, but as the city reaches the 85,000 population total and prepares for a new century, in the last few years it's worked hard on improving its image. And the Elgin Image Advisory Commission is always looking to find out new positive image creators. Then Chairman Kevin Kelly presided over last year's Elgin Image Award ceremony, which included recognition of the Elgin Hispanic Network, also Bethesda Church of God and Christ, whose members built a new church, and teacher Robert Politica, who is coach of the Elgin Sharks, who have become nationally known for their trackability. This year, a slight change in the nomination process, as the Elgin Image Advisory Commission will be looking at specific image improving categories by people and or organizations. Well, we're looking at nominations of people who have tried to improve the image of, of the city. Uh, basically three different categories. Those who have made a physical improvement to a building or something in town here that's made an improvement. Those who have contributed to a either an ongoing event or a single event that has improved the image of the city. And those that have just improve the image of the city by by their actions and such. We looked at the previous year's winners and the submissions and felt that uh, these three categories broke the winners down most appropriately. So we yeah we developed these so that we had a little bit better ideas to how to pick the winners this year. Last year, 60 different people or groups were nominated. You can still pick up a nomination form from Helga Stafford at City Hall, 150 Dexter Court, as nominations should be submitted to Ms. Stafford no later than next Thursday, September 21st. And seeing the joy of last year's winners helps make you realize just how important image can be to a city like Elgin. Well, definitely the mission of this is, is to uh, bring out the positive of the community and there is a lot of positive happening here in Elgin and we just want to make sure that we reward it by bringing, bringing them about with uh, awards and presenting it to the public. Last year's used Molda oil collection was such a great success, if I can tell you that, it will be repeated this upcoming Saturday, September 16th at the Elgin Public Works Complex at McBride and North Grove. Hours will be 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Any questions, you might want to call 208-3841. 208-3841, and again, that's going to be on Saturday, September 16th. You know, there are plenty of cats and dogs waiting for you in the South Elgin at the Anderson Animal Shelter. Remember, adopting a pet is quite a commitment by you and your family. But if you and the pet work together, that pet can become a meaningful part of your life. Time now to go to the Anderson Animal Shelter.
On this edition of Paw Pals, a wonderful, well, not a wonderful story, but a wonderful kitty that we want to tell you about. This is Bartles. Look at the eye, Bartles. How are you? Look at the eyes on this one to two year old neutered Siamese kitten. Kind of likes my uh, shirt here. That's nice. Bartles was abandoned on the back door here at Anderson Animal Shelter. This is a wonderful kitty, purring away, making lots of noise, loves life, would love to come to your home, and obviously not a more beautiful cat you're gonna see. Just take a look at that camera there, Bartles. So come on out, and, and this kitty can be yours. Adoptions cost $55 for dogs and $40 for cats. That fee includes a veterinarian exam, a stepper shot, a coupon for spaying or neutering, and a free collar with ID for dogs and a free tote box for cats. If you're interested in adopting Bartles or any of the other many dogs or cats at the Anderson Animal Shelter, give them a call at 697-2881 or stop in. They're located at 1000 South La Fox Street in South Elgin. They're open from 10 until 6 Monday through Friday and from 9 to 4 on Saturday. And before we go, we've got a couple of things to tell you about. You know, also on uh, Saturday, September 16th, remember last year it was a great fun time, Jurassic Classic Bikeathon. Say that five times quickly. That's taking place from 11 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. That, of course, Elgin Public Museum, a fundraiser, so you can get involved with that. So we'll see you out there. And also uh, the caboose days, the fall caboose days, of course, at the Fox River Trolley Museum. The first is this upcoming Sunday. September 17th. So you won't want to miss that. That's in beautiful South Elgin where the trees are over 300 years old. And as we head out of here, I want to salute these kids. They were at the council meeting the other night, the Elgin Classic Major Girls All-Star. They got a chance to stand up and say hello. And the Elgin Classic Little League Senior Boys All-Star team. You'll see the kids. We're out of here for the great cast and crew of the Elgin Week in Review. I'm Jeff Myers. See you next time. Uh, they gave us all they could give us at all times, and I just want to say that I was very, very proud of each and every one of them. Uh, there wasn't one single star. It was a team of all stars. So... Lauren Braco, Abby Hartman, Erica Beavers, Jackie Canna, Kelly Coffey, Kylie Tuota, Tia Sportsman, Laura Granke, Amy Slingelberg, Katie Niehaus, Gretchen Gab, Katie Kemmerlin, Melanie San Miguel, Jimena.